Well, let's get started. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, this is part of the CWDL webinar series on key mortgage topics for our clients and friends in the industry. And we're super excited to have a discussion with our extremely accomplished panel. Um, join me in welcoming our guests, Paul Loftus, CEO of Loan Vision, Paul Van Sicklin, SVP of Client Strategies at Terra Verde, Paul Hubbard, CFO extraordinaire and supporting CWDL's fractional CFO services, and of course our moderator, Mark Wilson, founder and managing partner at CWDL. Um, today we're going to be discussing how to do more in 2024. So a um, couple of housekeeping items. Um, this is supposed to be conversational and interactive, so if you guys have questions, do feel free to type them in the chat. Um, we usually get to most of them. If we don't, we'll circle back up with you after. Um, other than that, let's get started. Yeah, well, welcome everybody for, uh, thank, thank you all for joining our webinar. Um, obviously we do these webinars in an effort to try to make sure we're providing additional value for our clients and partners um, across the industry. And um, bear with me today, since we have three Pauls, I might be pointing at the, the Loan Vision Paul, the Terra Verde Paul, and the CWDL Paul today to, to go through uh, some of our questions. Um, but please ask questions uh, throughout this webinar. We want to make sure we're answering um, what your questions are. Um, but let's kick it off. I, obviously, we're, we're into 2024. We're talking about doing more in 2024 versus survive until 25, which um, I think a lot of us cringe when we hear that. Um, why don't we go around the, the room and I'm going to have you guys kind of popcorn this, just kind of you're going to jump in when you feel like, but what are you seeing in the market? How are you feeling about where we're at as an industry and um, and really on this topic of doing more in 24? So who wants to take that first? I'll jump in. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, hey everyone, Paul Loftus, CEO from, from Loan Vision. Um, I uh, took over the role in the second quarter of 2023. Um, having come from outside of the mortgage space, um, been in technology my whole career, um, but having come from the outside of the mortgage space, I, I'm seeing things with a fresh lens. That can either be good or bad. Um, I'll let you be the judge. Um, but what I think is clearly evident from seeing the reporting and seeing, you know, what our, our interactions with our uh, customers that we have over, you know, 250 customers in the IMB banking space um, in talking with them and, and in kind of understanding uh, what's come before me, before me coming into the mortgage space, um, you know, it's pretty evident that, that the loan origination volume isn't coming back. Uh, the 2019 and 2020 and 2021 um, that volume was was fantastic, obviously, but uh, but it, it, it not coming back anytime soon. And so the conversations that we're having in the market um, are really twofold. Um, one of them is we need to free up cash. Um, you know, we you know this whole survive to twenty five market cringe. Make, I, I cringe as well when I hear that. Um, and, and it's all about freeing up cash. It's all about creating an environment that uh, you know businesses feel like they can operate in twenty four more effectively, more efficiently, and more productively. Um, and, and so um, those are the types of conversations. The second part is that we hear quite often at Loan Vision is, you know, Paul, help us predict and project the future. Um, help us navigate what's ahead, even when we don't know what's ahead. Um, how do we do this for, for lower cost? How do we do this, you know, be more, more efficient, more effective? But then also, how can we be more competitive? Um, we're competing on every every single opportunity. Um, how can we offer you know a lower cost that finds its way to uh, those that are are, are uh, asking for the loan? So um, we hear we're hearing a lot of you know doing more with less right now and looking for many answers to try to try to find that. Yeah, I think that's right. We're hearing a lot of that as well. How about how about you, Paul, with CWDL? What are you what are you thinking? What are you seeing out there? Well, yeah, I'll do a quick intro as the other Paul did, but uh, I've been in the industry since 2008, worked at three different firms within the mortgage industry, tons of banking, commercial banking experience before that. Um, one of those three uh, companies that 
that I worked for in the mortgage industry was even a mortgage lender. So I've had a lot of different angles and perspectives and seen many, many different cycles. One of the things I find interesting about 2024 is um, I kind of expect it, at least for now, I've been surprised many times. I expect it to be one of the most boring years that we've ever had in the industry, at least since I've been in it. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, right now we're kind of expecting some modest improvement in rates and there'll be some uptick hopefully over 2023, but right now, not a lot of reason to think that we're going to have a lot of the normal distractions that occur during our business cycles. It seems like we're always either figuring out how to grow and hire and expand as reasonably as and quickly as we can. Or like the last two years, we're constantly trying to figure out how to how to cut expenses and right size our organization as the industry contracts. 2024 is kind of feels like it's that year for all those things we said we never have time to put all these process improvements and things like that in place because of the dynamic I just mentioned. Um, so kind of my theme of 2024 is yeah let's let's do it let's do all those things we never said we had time for let's get hardcore about all those core kind of activities um that that we never have time for measure everything figure out exactly what all our metrics need to look like um and use them when the time comes to grow our businesses and just as aggressively as we might when we're trying to, to shrink our business yeah that's great i i think i i think what you said there that it might be a little boring this year i i think and uh, the the outcome of that might be that those those people sitting on the fence on whether they want to sell their house kind of are are starting to get comfortable that rates are going to be within a certain certain level not going to move too much up or too far down. So waiting for rates to change, maybe they're getting more comfortable. And um, I'll be, yeah. So how about with you, Paul? Um, yeah. Paul, uh, Paul yeah. Hubbard never, never thought of it as boring. That's an amazing um, uh, <laughs> observation. Yeah. And uh, and it actually ties to something that I uh, actually read earlier today, a survey of CFOs, 88% of CFOs struggle to get the, the the right amount of value out of the technology stack that they've invested in. And tie that 88% number with your outlook of, of potentially um, uh, uh, using this time to invest in, in your processes, to invest in your technology and getting that value out of it. Uh, so I work for uh, Terra Verde and uh, we're focused on two things really one is optimizing your investment and and your and your use of your loan origination system and uh from that it branches out uh, maximizing the value of your data and analytics that are that come from your business which is which is in the loan origination system both the, the common denominator here is if you or if you tie those two things together uh, you're really focusing on uh building a culture of uh of financial and operational excellence. And that's really what um, what this opportunity is, I think, for us to do, so. Yeah, you know, coming out of, I we had the MCT conference last week and uh, I talked to a lot of clients there. And the one thing I, I will say that I, I feel, and I think a lot of people on this call are feeling, that, that there's a lot of optimism going in to this year and this quarter. Um, we're seeing some pipelines kind of building back a little bit. Um, I know we're not, I don't think we're going to have a record year of production, but people have gone through a lot of right sizing and they've gone through a lot of, a lot of changes. And so, um, having, having time, um, to, to go ahead and invest in some of these technologies, I think is important. And with that, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about that, the, the roles, um, that are sea level uh, best in class clients are doing, and when I say C level, I'm talking from the CEO and the CFO and the 
the operations people, um, how are they, how can they innovate? You know, how, how are you, how are you all seeing um, them attack this market and, and those that are outperforming the others, what, what are you seeing? How, how do you want to attack, you know, how are they attacking this market? So I could, I'd like to jump in on that first and then, then I'll let the, the technology folks kind of address the other, the other part of your comment there. I think before you can really even get a, aggressive and um, taking a look at the different opportunities that technology solutions, you know, could and how that could benefit you, you've got to know, you've got to measure what's going on today in your organization. Um, otherwise, you're not prepared to really understand how their technology is going to affect or benefit your organization and you're completely at the um, mercy, if if you will, of the vendor telling you, well, you'll save 20%, 50% because that's what all my other clients saved. Um, But if you've already buckled down at least, you know, on the basics of your um your own metrics, how, you know, what are your underwrites per day look like? What is your cost per underwrite? What's your closing costs? All these, all these things that somebody might have a technology solution for you on. If you don't already know what your costs are and kind of can get into the weeds to say, okay, if this AI underwriting tool could take me from on average two and a half underwrites to 1.75, I can calculate how much that's going to save me myself. Um, And you you just keep repeating that over and over again within your organization um, so that that you're prepared to to be the best consumer you can when it's time to have those conversations. Because don't get me wrong, I think there is a lot of great solutions out there. the flip side of that is there's a lot of people out there telling you they have great solutions out there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think if, if I had a, a, you know, all of us running a company, if we had a dollar for every time a software vendor told us they could save X number of, of percentage or, or dollars, we'd have a stack of them on our desk. Right. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, Mark to answer kind of address some of that, um, I think there's this realization that what got us here isn't going to get us to the next level. Um, I see with my customer conversations and with the CFOs that, you know, this this level of, to, to Paul Hubbard's point, this level of like a deeper cut of data, um, a deeper look at the business is essential right now, especially as volume is down and and maybe, you know, a little bit slower of a time. Um, and so that that deeper cut of data um, is is really what I think our, our customers are after. Um, I'll just share, you know, one of the first things I did when I came into Loan Vision in Q2 is I said, let's let's survey our customer base and let's learn about what they truly have seen um, as advantages or or, or uh, you know reductions in costs. Um, and and running loan vision compared to competitors or or what else is in the space, um, and I was staggered by the numbers. I mean, it, you know, what came back was was really staggering. And I think, you know, when when we think about you know what we're doing today, and this is personally, professionally, like being truly um, introspect, be, being kind of introspectful and, and looking at what it is that that we're operating, how we're operating today. And where those efficiencies are, whether it's technology or it's you know analytics or it's just overall process improvement, you know what what I've seen now is that the companies that have the most amount of discipline to not only you know run a software, or put in a new piece of technology, but more importantly change their processes, like really take a hard look and and ask the tough questions. Those are the organizations that are not surviving till 25. Those are the ones that are doing more in 24. I love that. I mean, I think Paul Vincilian, I'm screwing up your name there. Sorry. Vincilian, with, sorry. Yeah. So with Tara Verde, you know, he said 88% of CFOs struggle to get value out of their data. You want to take that, Paul, a little bit? Yeah. Further? And actually, Hubbard and Loftus, to tie those two comments together, you, you talked about 
understand what you have today and being able to measure it and then take a deeper cut of data. And what you're, what you're describing is a maturity curve of, of using your data and analytics to your, to your, to the maximum advantage. Um, uh, and I think, it, so my, I didn't mention it, but 20, I have 20 years of finance and accounting experience in, in banks. And, and I always took the idea of becoming a strategic business partner. And the way I did that was I, 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 I placed myself on that maturity curve from making sure I can describe what happened easily, effectively, efficiently, and then taking a deeper cut of the data because that deeper cut's going to get you to the next place, which is actually being able to impact what's happening inside, inside your organization. That's good. That's great. I, you know, I, I'm going to pitch this over to Paul Hubbard, um, you know, cause Paul's had a lot of experience being a CFO and being in industry and being on both sides. Now he's on, on the other side in client services. Um, and, you know, I think, I think Paul, I've, I've always respected you and you've always done an amazing job, but I'd consider you a high functioning, good CFO, great CFO. Um, and so from that perspective, now you're kind of seeing on client services, like what, what attributes or what are you seeing that top performing CFOs or even, even in your um, career leading up to this, well, you know, what, what, what made, what do you think? And I know this is tough. I know you want to be humble, but like, what, what do you think you're seeing out there? What made you so effective? Um, that's interesting. So a lot of the things that I share like today in terms of I never had time to do, um, as I'm hearing myself say that, I'm like, boy, I wish I was in in the CFO chair this year because maybe I'd finally have time to do all the things I, uh, yeah. I always said I wanted to get done. Um, I think part of it was um, despite um, despite feeling too busy or not always being given the resources that I um, that I felt would be helpful to to implement some of these types of things that I have talked about and we're going to continue to talk about. I've gotten creative and tried to find ways to kind of fund it myself. And so, um, you know, or, you know, if, if you're not getting a lot of attention from your, your, your peers on different initiatives that you want to do, then, um, then figure out ways to become more efficient in your own shop within accounting or somewhere else. And then, reallocate some of that time to accomplish the things that you want to get done um, and just keep rinse and repeat go do it over and over again and after a while your peers or your boss is kind of going well how, how did you how did you accomplish that you didn't even come to me and ask me to spend more money and it's amazing what you've gotten done and uh if I did give you some extra resources to do it, how much more could you do? No, I think that's great. I mean, I, I, I would just add that, you know, CFOs deliver the information that the rest of management needs to hear, mm -hmm. whether it's good or bad. And, um, and, and sometimes that's difficult, but, um, that that's what's needed. And I think a lot of times CFOs are stuck in doing the work as opposed to, focusing on being strategic and and this market is a great time to be strategic to your point it's a great time to take that those moments to do that and 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 really be forward looking and and, and drive incredible value that's why they got that's why they are the CFO right that that's why they have that title and um that's what can transform that yeah and Hubbard's comment on the efficiency piece is so critically important if you're if you are able to become an extremely efficient shop, what that does is it takes those same people that you know are 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 more valuable than just doing all the manual work that they've been doing and turn them and 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 point them to value added work. Then you're it's just gonna it's just gonna it's 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 a it's a it's just gonna be a snowball effect. It's gonna get better and better, bigger and bigger. Yeah, and I, I think Paul you know, Paul part uh, on the snowball. Sorry. Uh off this real quick um 
also you're making the jobs and the, the things that those people are participating in far more interesting far more. i assume than than you know the work they were doing before because most likely you got the repetitive kind of boring stuff out of the way and so now their job feels more rewarded and now you just get this momentum even as a groundswell because they're like oh my gosh if i help make the organization more effective than look at all these other great things I get to do, which expands on my career and um, just keeps snowballing on and on, which is actually what how I've historically um, helped a lot of people in my organization of was I was like, you know, I got to where I am because I just came to work every single day looking for that thing that needed to be fixed. And then just doing it, and if you just keep coming to work every day with that attitude, you'll you'll rise to the top. So, sorry, Paul. Uh, no, no problem. I, I was just going to say that um, you know we had a, a Lone Vision user conference last year, and I got a chance to you know kind of jump in the deep end, being new in the space and the market. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is Jim Deitch, the CEO of Terraverde, um, gave a talk. And afterwards, I sat at a table and ate lunch with a, kind of a group of different different customers. And, and they said, you know, um, you know we, we just we don't want to cut heads. And I, I thought to myself, that's that's interesting. It's, you know, what do you mean? And they said, well, you know, so much of what you talk about, what Jim's talking about, what others are talking about is cutting heads. And, and we're like a family. And it, it light bulb went on for me, which was, you know, the especially the independent mortgage banks, there is like a family atmosphere, right? They're very close knit. These are people who have worked together for many of you have worked together for many, many years and been in the industry. And even if you've left the company, you've gone to another one and you see each other at conferences. And and so there's this like loyalty. And and quite frankly, it's it's extremely um it, it, I believe it's extremely valuable for this industry and 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 what I see as a positive. Um, but to going to Hubbard's point, I think it's important that when when you talk about reduction of headcount, our customers came back and told us that, you know, they saw a 20 percent reduction in headcount by running our software, which is great. Um, but what I learned after digging deep or double clicking on that is that it was really more redeployment of headcount. And it was more about getting people to do more strategic roles and, and responsibilities in the business which to you, to your point, Van Sicklin, that's a snowball, right? If you have some smart people, which I think all of you do in your organization, it's not about reducing the headcount necessarily. It's about what areas can you put them in that are more strategic that can ultimately make your business more effective, more efficient, and, and ultimately more profitable. And that's where I think we're seeing some of the best companies um, operate at a at a high level because they're 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 redeploying into more strategic tasks. Yeah, and that's a great segue into the next part I want to bring up, and and that really leads us into cost control and cost optimization. I mean, is it more about control or is it more about cuts? I mean, we still, you know, we can't ignore the uh, a lot of red that we saw over last year. A lot of companies, most companies, lost money. Um, we're seeing that out of our our practice in general. Some some had gr had good years, but um, you know there's been a lot of losses. So so addressing that is is going into 24. Are we talking about optimization? Are we talking about more cuts? What are you what are you all seeing out there? Um, and I'll, I'll pitch this over to uh, Paul Van uh, Sicklin. Go you awesome. go. Yeah, well, so I'm going to go another survey. Last week, we actually attended um, a, 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 a conference uh, for, with a loan origination system, and we actually asked the people to participate in the survey. And we said, if you used all of your LOS data efficiently and effectively, how much would profit per loan increase? And this wasn't a cost question. It was a it was a profit per loan, which obviously costs are embedded. And the average was $1,700 per loan if we used our data and analytics efficiently and correctly. And, and 
there were there was a large percent that that answered between three and five thousand dollars per loan. And so what that tells me is that there's a gold mine in the data and analytics, and it, it's both a cost question and a profit and a profitability or and a revenue question because there's the gold mine and cost could be using you know being using all the automation that a particular platform provides. Um, um, and in the revenue side, it could be your pull throughs not come you know not coming through, and you're still and and you're still paying for those loans that didn't get pulled through, and that all, then also becomes a cost. So. I guess the point uh, is that is that um, is that there's the gold mine is there. Uh, there are ways to take advantage of it, and it's a matter of just grabbing it and 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 doing it. So, yeah, I, I'd say this is definitely an optimization play, Mark. Um, I, I have concerns about, uh, organizations cutting right now. And, and although I don't have a crystal ball as to when we're going to see the recovery, um, but the, the concern would be, you know, I've, you know, the, the homework I've done and the understanding I have of the industry is it's, it's very cyclical and there's been a lot of ups and downs and you all have weathered the storm and so many people on the phone have weathered the storm. Um, but the, one of the areas that I've seen is the, the most productive, the best businesses are the ones that recover the fastest when, the, when the market recovers and can accelerate the fastest. Those are the ones that get off to the fastest start and, and, in the recovery. And so, um, you know, I, I, I have a lot of concern about cutting at this point for our customers. Um, it is about that optimization and preparation to be able to, you know, really come out of the gates fast and keep your people and keep the prop, you know, keep the, the functioning processes. Um, and so in, in my opinion, you know, are you asking yourself the questions, the tough questions, like, do we close the books fast enough, right? Do we have enough information to predict and project what's happening in the next month or six months out or, you know, and, and, and if so, are we, you know, the cost, you know, the industry standard of 22% of, of uh, is, is the cost of doing business for loan fallout for me. I mean, are we really accepting that right now? Like our business is saying, you know what, that's the cost of, of doing business. Or are we investigating why someone, you know, uh, d does a loan application and, and then doesn't originate? Um, are we inspecting that detail and, and that process down to the level there's, there's to, to use Van Sicklin's point, there's gold in there, right? Even if you change that fallout by one or 2%, you're paying for any type of software or anything else that you put into your, your system. So in my opinion, I, I, I give caution to cuts right now. I think about optimization and asking every process that you have the tough question of, is this the most optimized process that we can be running? And if not, who do we look to for help? Right? Are we looking to our partners? Are we looking to our vendors? Are we looking to our consultants? Um, but but at this point, I think it's preparation for when we come out of this thing and accelerate. And whoever accelerates the fastest, I think, gets gets the most wins. Yeah. So on that on that general you know broad question of you know are we looking for these solutions in order to make cuts or um, or for efficiency. Uh, First of all, I wanted to say, um, if somebody's on this call and you haven't uh, made the cuts you need, you definitely need to give me a call. Um, so I'm assuming, I'm assuming the majority of the firms out there have already made the cuts they need to be making in order to to, to be right sized for this this market right now. So. The investments we're talking about here today, in my mind, are really all about uh, making your processes um, a lot more elastic, less variable, and therefore be be the firm out there who can go longer than your peers before you have to start adding costs as the market expands. And so as, as the market expands, you're better at leveraging that and your cost per unit is going down faster than your peers 
as more loan volumes coming your way. And, you know, <laughs> no secret out there, but the firms that will be able to um, outpace, you know, from a cost control standpoint, um, not only be more profitable, but they'll also have a lot more flexibility from a pricing standpoint. And so one leads into the other in terms of getting market share as we as we expand again. Yeah, and uh, and Ben Sicklin, we got a we did get a question. Sorry, my phone's ringing. But he, uh, we had a question that said, is, "Is all of that anecdotal? On what what specifically did you think they could do with their LOS data that would allow them to achieve those results?" I think that was probably related to the survey on the cost per loan reduction. Yeah, yeah. So is a survey on the profit per loan increase that you could. I think that's what that's related to. I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. And so, and no, it's not anecdotal. It's 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 real. It's there, um, and that it 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 ties to Hubbard's and Loftus's original comments about knowing being able to measure today, and then taking a deeper cut. Uh, because because measuring today in an efficient and fast way, getting that information to the organization, to across the organization, having a single source of truth, and then uh, providing that deeper cut allows you to do things like stack rank your branches or stack rank your 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 departments or your employees within your departments, uh, and we call that top tiering. Uh, and, and what that top tiering does is it allows you to address these different parts of your business in different ways. The, 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 the lower performing, that's where you're looking at cuts or, or, or put them on a plan, right? And the mid-tier performing, you want to elevate them. And the data, the deeper cuts provide them, provide you the answer because it, being able to slice and dice and, and spin in all the different variations that you need to in order to really understand what's happening with this particular branch or this particular loan officer where they're not acting in an optimal way. Yeah, and uh, I think, and, yeah. I'm sorry, keep going. I, no, it's okay. Yeah. No, I was going to say, you know, it, it's like, how are you using the data, right? Like, and, and the, oftentimes we talk to clients that there's, they have all this data, but um, I love, I love what you guys talk about as top tiering because it really drives home that point of of like really using the data to get efficient, and a good example of that is if you have a a a, a pretty standard credit box, and you have a one underwriter that makes you know 20, 25 decisions a month, and you have another underwriter that does five decisions a month or whatever, pick a number yeah. less than that. It's why is that happening? And to your point on, do you lift them? Do you find a way to train them to get them to 20, 25 decisions a month? Or do you just choose that it's time to find somebody who can? And, and those are those are the questions. And then the same is true with every process. If you don't know who your best performers are by task, um, that's from loan officers to processors, you know, even your accounting personnel, then then you're doing yourself a disservice. And we've talked about that a lot. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of what, what we call giving your balance sheet back. You know, we came out of 2021 and had amazing buildup of balance sheet. And over, since then, we've seen declines in balance sheet. And and without these, these uh, without using this data to make these decisions, you're you're kind of going off your gut sometimes, which I think, uh, can be a mistake. Um, so, so kind of to that point, like how are you? How are you all seeing people use their data? Um, like, what solutions are you seeing to help make better decisions out there? Um, and you know, and how how are we really aggressively pushing to move um, data through the bottlenecks and, and the other things that might be limiting um, our clients to make better decisions? would say um there there is not necessarily you know one secret special sauce on that so look at everything um but look at it look at it with a high degree of both optimism and skepticism all at the same time 
Um, you know, as a as a CFO, when AI was kind of first, you know, really becoming the buzz on almost everything. Um, but as an organization, we had some level of skepticism because there had been a lot of technology that was implemented, but there wasn't a lot of demonstrated savings. In fact, you know, overall costs kept going up. And so you had some jaded management, you know, that was like, yeah, every time somebody comes to me, a lot of great pro formas, never seen a bad pro forma in their life, of course, but uh, overall costs go up. Yeah. Um some of that is because as an industry, we've been very, very focused on adding technology in order to become more compliant or have a better experience for our loan officers and our customers. And so they haven't always been a cost savings initiative. But um, where I was going with that is, so when AI came up, you know, there was a lot of skepticism on it. I kind of, again, took the initiative to kind of quietly implement some very small projects within the accounting team and, you know, to take over during certain levels, certain types of um, purchase settlements and reconciliations of loan level activity um, in some other areas and started to actually see on those benefits and again, develop the metrics ahead of time so that after the fact, we actually could say, yes, those things did improve and be kind of that source to prove out the benefits of of that technology. Um, so AI is just one area. Um, there was great conversation earlier in terms of tiering. Um, I think as an industry, we do look a lot at loan officer comp kind of levels, but there is this very hidden cost that the guys who are throwing applications at everything and clogging up the system for underwriters to have to do at least an initial uh, underwrite and then have turn out that borrower wasn't even ready to do the loan or never, never should have gone that far in the first place. Um, and there's a lot of tools out there. Terra Verde has one of them to kind of measure that cost, how many underwriter touches do all of your loan officers cause you to have? And if you're if you're using all of your loan, excuse me, your accounting data to tie back and measure, you can ultimately go, it cost me X dollars per underwriter touch. Now you can measure how much various loan officers and people are costing you on top of their obvious comp package and start managing them that way not just purely on production yeah if you're only measuring your llo's contribution margin which is you know sales minus their cost right it, then you don't know what they're doing to clog up the system but go ahead uh, what well that's that's exactly right thank you um so so yeah so those solutions out there part of them are going to be something like ai or maybe an ai based underwriting system, um, outsourcers that are just doing it on a more effective cost uh, level than you are. Um, so you got to go out there and you got to look at everything and you got to know how much it costs you today before you can determine whether they're going to do it. And make sure that as you decide to adopt something, you already have the owners of where all those benefits are supposed to come from signed up and they say, yes, if you implement this and it performs as expected, I will be able to reduce X number of underwriters at this level of production so that you're, you're not trying to do that after the fact and then keep measuring yourself after the fact to add credibility to you know, the benefit that, that just came up. Otherwise, we're as an industry, probably not necessarily an industry, just in general, people are so, I signed it up, we, we implemented this, high five, and we're on to the next project. And guess what? Costs aren't going down. How come? And, and now you run into a roadblock the next time you want to do it. Yeah, I think yeah. that's really important concept is 
it's not just a one and done. It's a continue. It's a it's it's creating a culture of continuous improvement. You're not going to just implement whatever and then say that's we're going to get what we get. We're going to implement it and then you build a cadence into your business. The entire business looks at this and 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 measures it and continuously finds additional opportunity for improvement. Um, I think that's a really important concept to, in the how. Yeah. yeah. All off this, I'm going to pitch this over to you. So, you know, obviously technology is in your wheelhouse and you're in, and so are you seeing, what are you seeing out there on this front and how are they using it to, to improve some of the efficiencies? Yeah. I, I don't think I would, I would um, subtract anything that, that these two gentlemen have said. Um, I, I do believe that uh, having implemented a lot of technology in, in my, my career, and having sold it my entire career, um, change management is necessary. Um, you know, really focusing on your processes and and I, I like I like Hubbard's comment. You know, skepticism with a touch of optimism. Um, I, I like that because you know I, I I think it comes back and I'm sorry to be a broken record, but it's asking the tough questions and the businesses that we see right now, our customers that are asking the tough questions, that are actually asking me for more, right? They're saying, I need you to do more for us. It's part of the reason we partnered with Terra Verde to, to offer our, our uh, predictive analytics and modeling tool is because um, our customers were asking that. They were saying, you know, um, so th there is, I think, a receptivity in, in the market that I'm seeing to change. Um, and I think to, to Hubbard's earlier point, this is the time to do it. I, I know it, it you know, the time when when you know the loan origination is through the roof is is it, that's a tough time to make changes. Um, so now is the time to be the most um, you know to scrutinize your process and procedures and and to really look closely. I think you know I talked about it earlier, but um, loan fallout to me seems like a really great opportunity to look at you know what's happened. Um, and if it, and, and you also this top tiering of seeing who's who's clogging up the systems to Hubbard's point. Uh, who's actually, you know, what what that process flow looks like? Um, I think, uh, you know, to that deeper cut, that deeper look is is what we're seeing as the most efficient businesses right now are are operating under. Yeah, yeah. and the fallout piece is is part of the the bigger picture of the funnel, right? Fallout is a major portion of it and a major target, and that's where you can apply that continuous improvement. Uh, you're going to get a big hit just by exposing and understanding where the where and why the fallout's occurring but then it's a it's a, a applying a discipline and a cadence on, on that particular metric that's going to get you long-term long-term positive changes and i i know we've got a very a, a various of various um titles and roles and responsibilities on on this webinar and i would say that's not limited to one or or, or, any, or even two roles in the organization. That's everyone. This idea of continuous improvement, I, I often hear from you know, some lower level people in the accounting departments that will say, well, what, am I, what can I do? If, if you, you know, pull out a lens and you look deep into this and you bring this to your boss, right? I, I can tell you there is no conversation that I will ever turn away in my organization if someone comes to me and says, I have a way for us to save money or I have a way for us to make more money. If, if I turn away those conversations as a CEO, I should no longer be a CEO, right? And so this is a, this is a call to action for everyone on this call um, because I, I think this is, this, we all own this. And, and I think as a, as a steward of our industry and of the mortgage space and, and of the, you know, the people that are, are looking to get loans today, um, I think this is our way of, of making a bigger impact. And if you don't have a CFO title, it doesn't mean that you can't add a really big impact in, in inspecting some of this these processes, procedures, and data. That, that is so huge what you just said um, in terms of cultivating that culture of, you know, repeated on every all staff call, you know, we're, we're you know, we, we want to. We want to save money. Your opportunity is to come forward and share what you're observing. And if and then your obligation as CFO or CEO or any manager in the organization is to when somebody comes forward with that, that just became your new biggest priority is to dive into that 
and be super excited. And when it does save even the tiniest amount of money, celebrate it, advertise it on your staff calls, you know, spotlight the heck out of those people. Um, and then everybody else wants to be them. And it, it's just, it's, it's kind of a wildfire and you don't have to, you know, and then that's, like I said before, that's what helps fund these other bigger, broader kind of technologies that, that might be a little more expensive and require more resources. Um, but it absolutely starts with, with what you just said. Yeah. And there, and there's no substitute to make sure that the data that you're using um, is clean and good. And we talk about data hygiene at the firm a lot, but having that data that you can trust and believe it's correct is a big part. I'm sure there's lots of people on this call that have gone to management or even been management and looked at the numbers and said, this doesn't make any sense and I don't believe it. And so making sure that you have good technology with good data coming in there and so they can make those decisions is, is critical. I was, I, was, uh, I was just I was just thinking about that very thing because if if your analysis and your findings and everything, if, you know, without getting it too complicated, if you can tie it back to your general ledger or ultimately your financial statements, it adds an incredible amount of credibility to what you just presented. Um, and it's not just pure theory um, in terms of, of what you're going to do. And, and then you can say, look, this is how I measured it today. And that's how it ties directly into our financial statements. And so if we do these things, there will be this direct correlation again back into our financial results, which is ultimately what, what most of these things are all about, right? And and, yeah, if and, I think, can't get, and if you can't harvest the data you need out of your general ledger, then start there <laughs> because that's that's where, as a CFO, um, the the simpler, more friendly your general ledger is, that you can even just self-initiate on certain projects and download some stuff because you suddenly had a thought about a way that you might be able to save some costs, um, you know shameless plug here for for loan vision but uh in two different in two different versions of my cfo life um one of the things i appreciated the most was was so simple a cfo could do it so yeah it's a big deal having the data like there's not you, you somebody wants the information they go okay i'll get back to you in two weeks when i figure <laughs> out the answer that's a uh, two weeks lost and maybe maybe too late also the so that's, uh, you know, for information to be valuable, it needs to be both timely and correct, right? So there's- Important. And easy yeah. to access, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I learned that in accounting 101, but that's just the way it goes. <laughs> um, and and let, let's move on to like service levels and how this all plays into both internal, external um, service levels and um, and and then and then how it works at, to differentiate the companies that are out there, um, and you know, obviously, you have you have your internal uh, people, and how how it works with them, but you have your your loan officers who are often your customers in mortgage banking, and then their actual borrower experience. So let's talk about that, and I think we have a question coming up here too. I want to take a look at, but um, let's start with that service levels. How does it all play together? Well, you. You hit it on the head to a large extent that uh, for a mortgage company, kind of first and foremost, the loan officer is the customer, whether it's your in-house, your in-house loan officers, or if you're a wholesaler, you know, it's the, the broker loan officers. Um, and so everything you can do to make the process more, first and foremost, actually predictable for them um the better the more efficient and you know less time they have to spend in your systems as opposed to out with their clients or your clients um the better um and so again it's kind of similar to, to my theme on 
controlling costs and things. It's map out those processes, look for the things that are causing needless loops in in your in your process. What are the annoying steps that it requires your loan officers or any of your branch personnel or your broker customers if you're a wholesaler? Um, map it out find all that stuff and and get rid of it as fast as you possibly can i mean it sounds pretty basic but the opportunities are there i mean the the uh our our second survey question last week was actually about this topic and it was it was what percentage of the of the native automation in your los are you actually using meaning meaning are you taking advantage of what's already there and if and th- th- if you're not, it means that you're likely duplicating work. You're likely doing a lot of rework, um, uh, and and that's the that's the fundamental. And by the way, the percent was somewhere around thirty five percent. They people were only using thirty five percent of value that's already been defined for them in the form of automation, and a huge percent. I would also using like ten ten percent, fifteen percent. So you're you're. You're absolutely right, Paul. I mean, start with what you already have because there's probably so much um, functionality there that you're not already leveraging or at least not leveraging it as well as you could. A lot of times we implement some some technology, but then we don't really modify the back-end process behind that. And so now you've actually created maybe extra work for them because you forgot yeah. to get rid of this other find, piece. Yeah, there's, and, and we find that uh, people are trying to customize the system uh, to fit their existing workflow. And what that does is it basically takes them out of the, hey, there is a best practices here. Instead of moving toward the best practices, they're sort of backing away from it, which yeah. can cause a lot of- uh, right. dup- and, oh, and if it's-, if if it's a- a- Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. You know, I, you know, I, I maybe go down a little different path. You know, at Loan Vision, we um, started this this mantra of empowerment um, through accountability. Um, and this this mantra has kind of found its way into our customers as well. And so as we look at, you know, overall um, what it's going to take for for this this industry, for for our, our customers, for our, our future customers to be successful, it's it's empowering them. Um, and whether that's helping them redefine processes and procedures and working with companies like CWDL and, and helping that, but, but probably more importantly, I think it's, it's giving them access to what they need to be more efficient and more effective. And so um, as I, as I look at, you know, creating loan officers that, that are, you know, more efficient, more effective, it's empowering them with, you know, uh, vision into, you know, whether it's, you know, branch information, whether it's uh, commission information, whatever, whatever it is, it's, it's that empowerment level. So, you know, I think there's a, a significant amount of it, you know, empowerment through accountability and and we we're we're kind of eating our own dog food as it's as, so to speak when we when we talk about that as well. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. You know, we, we talk about this a lot, and I think it's fitting to this conversation. Um, you know, as it relates to getting to know your software and and what to implement it's this idea and this concept of slowing down to speed up. And and I see that a lot, you know. Companies who spend the time to really know what technology they have and 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 squeezing all the juice out of it that they possibly can will disproportionately do better in the long run. Um, those who train loan officers how to sell and give them the tools of how to do a better job will close more deals, is get more juice out of those those opportunities. And and I and I love that concept of slowing down to speed up. Um, we talk about it a lot in our firm. We had, I had a management call the other day and how we're bringing on new people. Like, are we, are we spending enough time training them to make sure that that takes time up front, but that'll allow us to speed up later. And I think that's really fitting in 2024. Um, we do have a question here that I want to, to get to. Um, it's from a capital markets or secondary perspective. What kinds of data analysts would you recommend the department to employ? 
And then uh, with whom should those analysis be shared? What roles, what departments, and what committees, et cetera? So this is a really a secondary market uh, measuring performance type of question. Who should be involved with that and what data should they be looking at? Who wants to take much that? Time. How much time do you have, Mark? Yeah, we have five minutes. So this right. is a right. one, minute, I, I, one minute question I'll, and answer. So you got, this is, we're getting to the rapid fire section. I'll yeah. defer my I'll, time I'll, to Paul Hubbard too, because I think he's <laughs> to answer this question. Yeah. Fair enough. This, this, is the, this is a topic that I am extremely passionate about and have had some success and a lot of resistance. Um, I, I think similar to what we just talked about, figure out how to actually measure the performance of your capital markets department, um, especially if you're hedging. Now, if you're hedging, it means it's especially hard to do what I'm saying because we don't hedge on a loan level basis. But um, I've been involved in some projects and a lot of conversations around some methodologies to allocate those hedging activities back out onto a loan level as a proxy to be able to say how, what is our true gain on sale or loan profitability across various products or various um, channels. And you cannot do that until you come up with a way to, to do that. Uh, you have to start with involving your capital markets group um, in that process, because if they don't, buy into what you're trying to do then it's never going to go that's 100 percent correct you know if you th th take that allocation piece and no matter what you're talking about if there's allocations involved it gets ugly and so the best way to deal with that if you, you got to have a proxy and you use an allocation methodology and everybody understands that the allocation methodology is deployed here and it's and it's transparent and the transparency of your methodology will help you actually communicate and, and start measuring and, and moving forward with it. And if it's consistent, it's meaningful and important and you can make decisions from it. And, yep. and also looking, you know, there's a lot, we could go on and on about that. Right. And looking That's to, right out of the CPA exam, I think Mark. Yeah. Don't get me started. But anyway, um, but listen, Hey, thank you all for, for your contributions. I think we got to the questions that were proposed. If you guys have more questions that you'd like us to answer, please, please uh, let us know. We will get back to you all. We definitely ran out of time. Thank you. We, we had more, more topics to talk about. So I apologize uh, that I didn't get to all those, but I thought the conversation was meaningful. Um, and I'm going to pitch it back over to Casey because we always want to make sure we start and end on time here because we value everybody's time. And I'll, I'll let Casey take it from here. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you all. It was a great conversation. Um, had a feeling it would it would come right up against time. So um, if anybody does have any other questions, feel free to reach out. I'll make sure that they're um, given to the right individuals. Um, we do send a uh, survey out at the very end of this. So if you guys wouldn't mind taking it, um, it just helps us make sure we're bringing the most relevant topics to y'all. And um, you'll also receive a recording of the webinar. Um, Paul, Paul, and Paul. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, Mark, great job moderating. We appreciate everybody. Thank you all. Will, will we, have, you. we have we have two minutes. If somebody wants to dump a last minute <laughs> question in, do a rapid answer. Do we have it? No, no, no chats. All right. Thank you all once again. We really appreciate it. We value these partnerships. Um, we really do. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care, everybody.